In this video, I'm going to talk about the connection between confidence intervals and hypothesis tests. So in statistics, we have um, two main tasks that we want to do. Um, and I call these our two main inferential tasks, and they're um, performing hypothesis tests and then creating confidence intervals. And you've probably heard me say the sentences that I like that go along with each of these. So the sentence for hypothesis tests is, is this number different than zero? And the one for confidence intervals is, what other reasonable values could we have observed? Each of these inferential tasks is going to use a sampling distribution to answer the question. A hypothesis test is going to use a null distribution. And a confidence interval is going to use a sampling distribution centered around the sample statistic. So the null distribution for hypothesis tests, that's a sampling distribution centered around the null value. And we just have a special word for it, which is null distribution. Um, we don't have a special word for the sampling distribution that's centered around the sample statistic. And to illustrate this, I'm gonna show you um, two different comparisons of groups. So the first one are these ants. Um, so imagine that we have two groups of ants. And on average, we found that there was a difference of three quarters of an inch in the length of those ants. So as humans, we think about that, we kind of know about ants and we think, wow, that seems like a really big difference. We think that that's gonna be statistically significant. And then on the other hand, I have these two tug of war teams, the blue shirt people and the pink shirt people. And I measured the height of those people. And I found that there was an average difference of three quarters of an inch between the two uh, tug of war teams. And again, as humans, we have some understanding, some contextual knowledge about how tall people are. So we say, well, we don't think that that's probably statistically significant. That could just be the result of chance. So we're going to try to make some conclusions about the population, both of ants and of tug of war teams, based only on information from the samples that we have. And we're going to use simulation methods in order to do our inferential tasks, which is our, our hypothesis tests and our confidence intervals. And I'm first going to show you how we can use simulation in order to create a randomization distribution to use for hypothesis testing. So here I have some data about the heights of my tug of war teams. So I've got the people with the blue shirts on, the people with the pink shirts on, and I have their heights in inches. And I observed that the mean of the blue shirt group was 67.8 inches, the mean for the pink shirt group was 68.6 inches, and then we had an observed difference in means of 0.8, you know, three quarters of an inch. So that's what we had in our sample, and we're trying to see is that statistically significant? Is that number really different from zero if we're thinking about the population? So what we're going to do is we're going to build up a randomization distribution. Um, we're going to look at what the world would look like if the null hypothesis were true. And the way that we're going to do that is we're going to break the relationship between the heights and the shirt colors. So I'm going to mix up the, uh, the shirt colors um, and then I'm going to compute the mean heights of the new teams. And I'm gonna repeat that process many times. So every time I mix up the values of the shirt colors, I'm gonna get a different set of means for the two groups and a different difference of means. Um, and if I do that many times, where many usually means a thousand, then I would get a distribution like this. So this is a randomization distribution. Um, so this, we could call this also a null distribution. And a null distribution is always centered around the null value. So it's always centered around the null. And in this case, our null value is zero. And then we could say, okay, if the null hypothesis were true, how likely would it be to see something as extreme or more extreme than our uh, observed test statistic. And in this case, our observed test statistic was maybe here um, at, you know, three quarters of an inch. And so there's a huge amount of the distribution that is as extreme or more extreme than, uh, than that observed test statistic. 
So I would say it would be pretty easy to observe a value like that if the null hypothesis were true. So with the tug of war teams, it looks like if the null hypothesis were true, it would be pretty easy for us to observe a difference of three quarters of an inch. But I could do that same procedure with my ants, um, and I could mix up what the label was for the group that the ants were in, you know, group A or group B. Uh, I could compute the difference of mean sizes for those randomized groups, and I could do that many times. And this would also create a randomization distribution. Um, so this is the difference in mean sizes of ants. Um, again, it's centered around the null value, which again is zero. Uh, but then we could ask the same question again. So if our null hypothesis were true, how, how likely would it be to observe a statistic as extreme or more extreme than the one that we actually saw? So here, our observed statistic is maybe out here. And if we're looking at how much of the distribution is as extreme or more extreme, it's a pretty small area. So if we wanted to know how likely it would be to observe a statistic as extreme or more extreme than this observed sample statistic, um, we would say that it would be pretty rare if the null hypothesis were true. So in that case, um, the difference of three quarters of an inch looks to be statistically significant. If the null hypothesis were true, it would be very rare to observe a difference of three quarters of an inch. So that's creating a randomization distribution to help us with hypothesis testing. We also might want to create a bootstrap distribution to help us with creating confidence intervals. So to imagine this, again, think about our data about our tug of war teams. We've got our blue shirt people and our pink shirt people. And to do bootstrapping, I'm not gonna break the relationship between the shirt color and the height. I'm gonna maintain that. But I'm gonna take samples with replacement from my original data set. So I'm gonna select that person, and then this one, and then this one, and then that person again, and then maybe this person. So you can see I got that 66 inch tall blue shirt person twice, then I got the 73 inch tall blue shirt person twice, and the 68 inch person with the blue shirt once. There's a couple blue shirt people that I didn't sample at all. And then I would do the same thing for my pink shirt people. Take a sample with replacement that's the same size as my original data set. So this is almost like taking a new sample from the population. And then I can use that sample. So it's got 66, 66, 73, 73, 68. I can use that as my new data set. And I can find the mean height of each of the groups. And I can find the observed difference in that bootstrap sample. And in this case, we got different means, but we actually got the same, the same difference of means. And again, we could repeat that process many times, like a thousand times, and we could create a bootstrap distribution. So here's our bootstrap distribution for our tug of war teams. This is the distribution that's going to help us with a confidence interval. So this distribution is going to be centered around our sample statistic. So instead of being centered around zero, it's centered around uh, three quarters of an inch. Um, and we could use the 95% rule to kind of eyeball where's the middle piece of this distribution. I would say it's like, you know, this chunk here. Um, or maybe a little bit further in if we want to be a little more conservative. That's my middle of the distribution. I've actually um, computed the middle 95% of the distribution there. So the middle 95% of the distribution goes from negative 3.4 inches to 4.3 inches. We could look at that on this distribution, something like from here to maybe here. That's the middle 95% of our distribution. So if we were asking the question, what are some other reasonable values of height differences that we could find, we could have just as easily found a height difference of negative three inches to a height difference of positive four inches. And that's a pretty big range. Um, and we could do the same thing for the ants. So this is the bootstrap distribution for the ants. Again, it's centered around the sample statistic. And again, we could use the 95% rule to guess where the middle 95% of the data is. I would say it's probably around there. Um, and then I've actually computed it. So it goes from about negative one, two, 
uh, negative point uh, four eight. We will say that's uh, something like that. So that's the middle 95% of the data. Some other reasonable values we could have observed are a, a difference of negative an inch to a difference of negative a half an inch. That's kind of the range of reasonable values. And the piece where we start making connections is when we line up our bootstrap distribution and our randomization distribution. So this is for my tug of war teams. And I've got my randomization distribution. And then I have my bootstrap distribution. I've lined them up so that the axes are exactly the same. So we can look at our uh, observed sample statistic in our randomization distribution, and it would be very common if the null were true. So that would cause us to fail to reject the null hypothesis. Um, and then when we look at the bootstrap distribution, what are some reasonable values we could have observed? Well, uh, anything from like negative three to positive four. And uh, so that's gonna be centered around the value that we did observe. That's always gonna be the middle of our confidence interval. But uh, there's some other reasonable values we could have observed. Versus for the ants, now I have my randomization distribution and I have my bootstrap distribution. And then again, I can think about my observed sample statistic, um, which in this case was negative 0.75. And it would be weird if the null were true. And then if we look at the reasonable values we could have observed, some other reasonable values, well, they're going from negative one to negative 0.5. So both of these graphs are gonna give me evidence that I could reject the null hypothesis. In my randomization distribution, which is centered around my null of zero, I can see that my observed sample statistic would be very weird if the null were true. So that would cause me to reject my null hypothesis. And then my confidence interval, it goes from negative one to negative 0.5. So there's no positive numbers in there. It's all negative numbers. And so the, the reasonable values don't include the null. And so then um, I can reject the null hypothesis. Versus back here, when we were doing the tug of war teams, we saw that it would be very common to get a difference of 0.75 if the null were true. And then when we looked for some other reasonable values we could have observed, that went from negative three to positive four. So it was a huge range and it included zero, which means mm, we can't reject the null hypothesis. Our null value of zero is in the range. So again, we've got our two main inferential tasks. We've got our hypothesis tests and our confidence intervals. Um, hypothesis tests usually go with the randomization distribution and confidence intervals go with the bootstrap distribution. But you can actually um, make conclusions about hypothesis tests by looking at bootstrap distributions and vice versa. So my final thoughts are that we have two main inferential tasks. We've got uh, hypothesis testing and we have confidence intervals, but these are two sides to the same coin. So either way you um, create your distribution, whether you use a randomization process or you use the bootstrap, we can draw conclusions about the population based only on information from the sample.